Woo. I don't know about you, but I uh, actually wanted the worship to go on for just a little bit longer, but uh, I'm mindful that music isn't just worship. Uh, that what we do, everything that we do in this space is worship this night, whether we're greeting one another, whether we're praying for one another, whether we're receiving our offering, whether we are talking, and whether we are just sitting quietly in our pew, everything is worship. And so I want to read to, from Scripture for you this evening. It's from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. And I'm taking this version from the English Standard Version. I'm not sure who's English or who's Standard, but it's from the English Standard Version. The writer to the book of James says this, What good is it, my friends, if someone asks that they have faith but does not have works? Can that faith save them? If a sibling is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for their body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, well, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, do you well? Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by one another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. And the people of God, we say, Amen. Let's pray together. God, we want to thank you for this act of worship this night. We want to thank you for gathering us safely into this place so that we might raise our own consciousness and awareness of where you are in our life. Gathering together as community to celebrate and worship is a way of our connecting and remaining connected to the source of love, the source of life. So gather us in, O oh God. Prepare our hearts and minds now that we may have open hearts and open minds to the fullness of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, not just a Christian, but a follower of Jesus, a follower of the way, a follower of this carpenter who lived amongst us all those years ago and who lives again in each and every one of us. Bless us with that awareness of your spirit that lives within us, and through that spirit, God, set us free, free from the shackles of the world, free from the expectations of others, and just free to that place that is within you. And so now, God, I pray that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this night. And may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, may they be acceptable to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So those of you who are regulars here at Cathedral of Hope, you'll know that this year we decided that we wanted to do two things. We wanted to build on what we did last year, which was to, uh, in a sense, reclaim Christianity, to reclaim what it means to be a, someone who is called to be a follower of Jesus, uh, to reclaim the sacred text, to see the Bible as our friend and not as our enemy, uh, not to use the Bible as a weapon that often gets used to beat one another over the head, but rather to see it as a source of liberation, a source of a spirit, to reclaim what it means to believe in a God who is still speaking, a God who is still present, a God who is alive and well and lives and breathes through those who claim to be followers of Jesus. We spent the whole of last year in so many ways reclaiming some of those sacred texts, some of those uh, passages that have often been used to damage us, to hurt us, uh, to put us down, and to give us guilt and shame in our lives. And we reclaimed those scriptures so that we would have a fresh idea of what it really means when we open our sacred text and that we come to believe, we come to believe in this God of love, not a God of vengeance, not a God of hatred, not a God of judgment, not to say that those things aren't sometimes needed in our lives, but not that God that is always uh, wanting to, to, to thwart us or to make us feel unworthy, but this God that's expressed in Jesus, this God of love, this God of forgiveness, this God of compassion, this God of kindness that Jesus speaks of in his own ministry. 
And, and we took the whole of the year really to think about what it means to reclaim a faith for our own, to make it our own. Not the faith of our parents, not the faith of our ancestors, not the faith of a previous church or even a previous existence. And not even the faith of a particular pastor or of a particular doctrine, but to make faith real and personal. And I don't know about you, but for many of us, that was a very liberating experience. Uh, I remember in my work in 12 Steps uh, back in the United Kingdom that often folks who were coming into rehab uh, find, found a struggle to connect with their higher power. And they found it a struggle to connect with their higher power because they have saw their higher power as this, this God of vengeance. Um, and, and so uh, uh, for many of those folks, and you know I come from England, so when, when we lose our job or we get fired from our job or we retire from a job or if we resign from a job, uh, we get what's called a P45. Uh, now, I know you don't call it a P P45 here. I think you call it a pink slip or something. Well, go figure. Um, <laughs> So uh, here in the United States, you, you get a pink slip. Uh, and what I used to tell my folks was that, you know, it's time for you to give God, that God that you knew, a pink slip. It's, it's time for you to, to, to just re renegotiate on your own terms who this God is that you've come to discover and you've come to believe in. And, and so we did that hard work last year. We did a lot of work around that. And perhaps those of you who are new amongst us, that's some of the work you're still doing. And uh, we, 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 we validate that. We, we offer you this sacred space in which you can do that. But this year, we've moved to a place in our church where we're talking about wanting to be all in, going a little bit deeper in our own spiritual journeys. That if we want to reclaim Scripture, we then have to live it. We have to live what we believe. And so this year, we've been really thinking about delving deeper. Uh, we've established a lot of small groups and Bible studies and home groups in which we can uh, delve a little bit deeper into those uh, sacred texts one-on-one -on -one and in small groups in tens and twelves and in affinity groups and all sorts of things. And there'll be more of that rolling out towards the end of the year. But it's been exciting to watch as people have been uh, grounding themselves and going a little bit deeper about what it means to be all in. All in in mind, body, and spirit. All in of reconnecting those pieces sometimes of our fragmented lives, our lives that we so often compartmentalize, uh, the bits that we leave out from the church, those bits that sometimes the church has told us to leave out uh, of our own sacredness. Uh, and finding ways in which we can go a little bit deeper. And so this sermon series that we're in the middle of has been about rooting, about rooting ourselves. Reverend Andre Block says often at the 10 o'clock service uh, that we have to ground ourselves, that we plant ourselves. And sometimes we plant ourselves in those places that aren't good for us, and other times when we find a church perhaps that we've now called home, that we plant ourselves in that good soil, in that good place uh, that offers us the growth and, and, and spirituality and, and, and a God that we totally understand and a, a God that, uh, that we totally find ourselves falling in love with all over again. And so in these last few weeks, we've been talking about what it means to be rooted. And we started off this whole series by talking about rooted in the Word. And uh, once again, challenged ourselves uh, to think about how we read Scripture uh, and how that Scripture comes to life when we really understand the context of the Scriptures that we're reading. Remembering that our, uh, our Bible is, is 66 books that were canonized by a, a particular group of people at, the, at a council all those years ago. Um, and that these books that we have in the Bible were canonized for certain reasons. Uh, they were made authoritarian. They were made the authority of the Bible. And that uh, when we read the Scriptures, we need to know the context. We need to understand who they were written to. We need to understand why they were written, for whom, by whom, and when. And that just like any other piece of literature, we have to know our social location. We have to know where they come from in order to fully understand and most of the New Testament, the, the Christian Gospels, we understand, are seen through a Jewish lens. They're seen through the Jewish context, just as the Hebrew Scriptures. Because by the time all of the Christian Gospels were written, the church was still a part of the synagogue. They were still part of the people who were seen as the chosen ones. And most of the writings of the New Testament were written to a folk, a group of people who were trying to work out, they were struggling with their own salvation, struggling with their own identity, struggling with what it really meant to be a follower of Jesus. Now, the word Christian hadn't even come along. And so they were struggling to work that out. And that when we root ourselves in Scripture, we need to understand that. So that when we read Scriptures that seem a little odd to us, uh, perhaps in our context of a 21st century, we need to understand why they were written, how they were written, and to what group of people they were written. 
That doesn't mean that they don't have application for us because they really do. When we talk about God is love and love is God, and if you are, if you are a person of love, then you are a person of God. Uh, that's, of course, extremely important to us. But just like we found out on Sunday, uh, when, when Jesus talks about him being the great shepherd or the, the good shepherd uh, in, a, in a place like Dallas, where we don't have sheep all the time, it's hard for us to understand what that really means. And so it's in, important for us to root ourselves in the Scripture and to know where God is speaking to us. And then last week, Reverend Andre, uh, uh, Andrea spoke to us uh, about rooted in community and about understanding the importance of finding our tribe, finding our community, finding our people, and living together in community. She also talked to us very clearly and passionately that churches are not perfect places, that churches are full of messy people. And uh, No, not this church, of course. <laughs> Never let it be said. Uh, but the truth is that churches are filled with messy people, and we pretend to be perfect, we pretend to look good on the outside, but we know on the inside that there's messiness going on. And sometimes in our family systems and in our communities, often we act out with one another and we do silly things with one another. Uh, and when we forget to forgive one another and then we break up just like any particular family. And most of us come from those systems. And so why should we think the church should be anything different? Many of us come from those family systems that are messy and churches can be messy too. Not all of us believe the same, not all of us look the same, not all of us uh, even worship God the same way, but that's okay. If church is about building community, if church is about placing ourselves rooted in community, then we have to work through the messiness and expect the messiness, perhaps even celebrate the messiness and just accept that everybody is different. We are all unique human beings. Some of us have also come from those churches where everybody has to look the same think the same. I came from the Mormon tradition. I remember uh, in my own community, we all looked the same. We all walked around with a big smile on our face. You know, have you ever seen Book of Mormon? You know, you ring the doorbell and you say, hi, I'm Elder Price. I'm not going to sing it for you because uh, that's as far as I know anyway. So, uh, but you know, we, we, there was a, homogenous, a homogeneity about, about the ways in which we gathered and the ways in which we look. And I, I, I know that there are former Mormons in this congregation this, uh, this evening, and I just want to say I have great memories of my Mormon roots and my Mormon tradition. Not everybody has that experience. But one of the things that the Mormon church taught me was you take care of your own. You take care of your community. You keep your community close, even when you disagree with one another. You keep them close. I'm still a member, actually, of the Mormon Church. Um, I was never excommunicated. I never resigned my membership. And uh, I said to one of, my, one of our colleagues, uh, who's also in the service this evening, who's also a Mormon, uh, the Mormons know where I am. Uh, they, they keep track of me, uh, and they know where I am. And uh, every now and again, I'll, I'll meet up with one of the bishops of the, of the stakes uh, here in the, in the United States, and uh, they'll look over at me and say, Brother Thomas, why don't you just come home? And I say, I am home. I'm very happy in the community that I have found myself. And so, so this evening, we, we kind of move on. I know there's a long introduction, but sometimes we just need to be recapping on, on where we've been because they, sermons also build on each other. It's one of the great things about sermon series is that they can build on one another. They can go deeper as well, and we can be rooted. And so the, this evening, we're, we're talking about being uh, rooted in service. And you heard the scripture for us this evening, but for taken from the book of James, about faith without works is dead. How many people have heard that before? Faith without works is dead. And uh, I, I've often wondered, well, why, why, did, why did the writer have to write this to this particular group of people? And the truth of the matter is that for many, uh, historically, faith had become almost irrelevant. Um, it was really about ritual. It was really about being seen in the right place at the right time. Uh, and even in Jesus' time, we know that uh, whenever it came to the big religious festivals like Passover and, uh, and, and uh, uh, Sukkot and, and some of the other Jewish festivals, uh, many of them would then have to journey from wherever they were all the way back to the temple because there was a belief um, that, the, that God existed in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. Now, I'm not going to try and explain the whole temple system to us, but uh, just to suffice to know that there was a, 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 a place where God was, where the Torah sat, uh, was only where the priest could go, the high priest. And the high priest intervened with, for the people on, and spoke directly to God. God spoke directly to the priest. 
uh, the high priest. And that was the person who was allowed to go in and was seen holy enough to go and meet with God in the Holy of Holies where the Torah sat in the temple. And everyone else was out on the outside and, and depended on where you were politically or religiously or even in a social scene, uh, sometimes and also around gender, uh, was where you could be in the place of the temple. And so it's really important for us to understand. And so many of, many of those folks that Jesus was talking to and some of those early believers uh, still were grappling with what it really means to be a follower of Jesus, what it meant to be in personal relationship with God. Uh, many of us saw it as a, as a relationship with God was through the sacrifice or through the pilgrimages or through the places when they, they, they combined their secular and their religious and, and the writer to the early church, to those early believers, as they started separating, their, separating themselves out from the synagogues, began to say, no, faith without works is dead. And this wasn't a new concept. Even the writer tried to help them link the, the situations of the past with Abraham and Rahab and many of the other religious peoples who have been around long before that they would have studied and that they would have heard of. And he says, you see, over and over again, you get the picture that faith without works is dead. Faith without service is dead. It's not just about believing the right things. It's not even about believing a set of rules and regulations or doctrines. It's about how you live that out. It's how you put that into service. It's how you measure your faith is by what you do, not by what you act in service, not by just what you say with your mouth. And I don't know about you, but I think we live in a, a culture just like that now. There are so many people who say they believe in God, but their actions don't seem to follow in line about how they live out their relationship with God. And, and, and here in our church, as we reclaim and as we go further in, as we claim ourselves and go all in, we too have to ask ourselves, are we just living through the motions or are we putting our faith into action? Are we really making a difference in the world? Are we allowing our faith and our deeds to come together so that the way that we live is concurrent with what we say we believe? And I don't know about you, but I think that's a struggle, right? That's, a, that's something we have to learn to live into. In our modern way, we would say we lean into those situations. Uh, we lean in so that we can get closer, we can challenge ourselves, and we can ask ourselves, uh, is, our, is our walk matching our talk? Walk the walk and talk the talk. Are we really leaning into these moments? And, and in our world today, I believe that the world needs to see more actions of our Christians than it does the words of our Christians. Because if you're anything like me, if you're watching Facebook, there are so many ways in which folks who say that they are Christians just don't seem to match up with what they are actually doing in the world. That there are so many today, and that's not, that's not, that's not, well, I would say it's not a judgment, it's an observation. Um, because we don't like to be judgy. Um, but I observe so many people who, who say that they are, are Christian and yet their lives don't seem to match up. We seem to be so concerned with judging one another rather than loving one another. We seem more concerned about pointing our finger at somebody else without realizing that there's three fingers and a thumb that are pointing back at ourselves and asking ourselves, uh, am, I really, am I really a follower of Jesus? Am I really matching up? Am I really rooted in my service? Am I rooted in my service to others? Am I rooted in my service to ensure that, that my side of the street is clean? Am I rooted in service so that when someone is needy, I don't just uh, say, well, thoughts and prayers. We've heard that a lot recently, amen? You know, I'm gonna offer you thoughts and prayers. But the writer to the, to the, to the early church said, you can't just say, thoughts and prayers without actually doing something. You can't see someone naked and say, well, I hope God gives you warmth without offering them a blanket. You can't just say thoughts and prayers. We have to match our, our language with our service. We have to be rooted in the service to one another. A few years ago, actually about two years ago now, uh, some folks in this particular service, this particular congregation came to us, and uh, John and Lewis, I don't want to embarrass you, but you came to the church and you said, we, we really want to match what we say. We want to be rooted in our service. And we want to start a service. You know, we're so often in our churches, we, we invite the homeless in and we feed the homeless. Well, we want to, we want to cook some meals here. And then as a, a, a group of ambassadors, we want to go out into the city and take those hot meals 
uh, to the people. And, uh, you know, I'm a yes, you can type of a person um, and then suffer the consequences later, you know. Uh, and so I said, yes, you can. And I don't know how we all figured this out, but we you know, finally came to a good place. And now twice a, mo- twice a month, uh, we cook something like 200 meals here at the church on a Tuesday and a Thursday. And there's a group of ambassadors, sometimes more people than you even think you need. And they go out into the city and they find the homeless folks under the bridges and sleeping uh, on the streets or at the end of freeways. And they give the food. But you know what? They don't just give the food. They don't just give the food. They sit with these folks. And they ask their story and they talk about their story and they invite them to Saturday breakfast here and they invite them to Monday food pantry and they invite them to find a safe place here at Cathedral of Hope. Faith without works is dead. It's about how we live out our lives, about how we live out our calling and how do we make real on what it is that we believe God is calling us to do. Now I know um, churches right now and I, I want to step out on a limb, and if I am, and if I'm treading on people's toes, uh, then I'll, I'll, just say, I'll just apologize now. Forgiveness is easier than permission. Um, but, you know, I, I know that there are lots of folks in churches right now who keep saying to their preachers and to their pastors, I wish you'd stop preaching politics from the pulpit. I wish you'd stop talking about politics from the pulpit. And I, and I, I want to tell you, it's, it's very frustrating for those of us who are clergy especially those of us who are on the progressive wing of the Christian church because we truly believe that politics is what Jesus was all about. Now, I want to be very clear. This was not about partisan pro- politics. This is not about whether, you, whether you're Democrat or whether you're Republican or you're somewhere in the middle or you're a, non, a non-decider. Uh, this is politics with a small p because Jesus spoke power and spoke truth to power. Je- Jesus often went about disrupting the systems of his own day. You, you can't tell me that you don't read the scripture when Jesus went into the temple where they were selling uh, all of those goods and forgetting the poor and he turned those tables upside down and he said, you've turned my house into a den of thieves. You can't tell me that that was not a political move. You, you can't tell me it wasn't political when Jesus healed the 10 lepers and only one came back and Jesus said, your faith has set you free in a system where disabled people, those who were disenfranchised, were kept on the margins. You can't tell me it wasn't a political move when Jesus sat with the woman at the well on a day when women were not allowed to be spoken to by men because men would be seen as unclean and unpure. And for a rabbi in his day, that would have been seen as something that was out of order. You can't tell me that Jesus wasn't political when he went to, went to the Roman authorities and he said, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar and unto God that which is God. You can't tell me that Jesus wasn't political. Jesus was political. And and church, we we too have to be political because politics is about uh, disrupting the systems of our world. And, And we need to speak that truth to power. We need to speak that truth to power in Alabama today. We have to speak that truth to power. We're rooted in our service when we are transforming the world and we speak that truth to power when 24 white older men tell women what to do with their bodies. We can't do that. That is, the church has to speak to those issues because we're rooted in service. We're rooted in what we do. The church has to speak. And I believe that people are leaving the church because the church has become irrelevant today just as it was more than 2,000 years ago. We have to speak truth to power. And this today, I want to tell you, some of you know that the president of Brazil is going to be in town this week. And the president of Brazil um, is well known, not just for his homophobic standpoints, uh, but there are more people murdered in Brazil because they're gay or because they're transgender than almost any other country in the world. And tomorrow and Friday, uh, the president of Brazil is going to be here in Dallas. And I, and I wrote to my, uh, to my colleagues in the other, uh, other faiths in this community, and I said, you know, we need to make a stand. We need to say that we shouldn't be welcoming this person with open arms. We shouldn't be giving him the official city greeting to Dallas. And I want to say I'm extremely proud of my religious colleagues, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim, who sent a letter today and said, we condone, we do not condone the hate speak, and we're standing alongside our LGBTQ plus members of Dallas because we want this to be an inclusive city. That's political. That's standing. That's speaking our truth to power. And that's being rooted in our service. That's the gospel's calling. 
It's not just fluffy, fluffy, I love you. (laughs) Rooted in service means that we are rooted in what we believe and our words must match our actions. And that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's not just saying, I love you, you're so wonderful, you're so wonderful, you're so wonderful, I love you, you're so beautiful. It's about calling people out as people call me out. You know, I'm, t- I'm talking to us all here. I often in my, on the line on a Sunday or on Monday morning emails, I get called out. I get called out for something I may have said, and I want to I I honor that because a preacher is not God. A preacher is just someone who tries to make sense of what it means to be someone who's a follower of Jesus. So I'm at 8.06 and time's running out, and I know that the musicians want to get back up here and do some, but I want to just tell you this evening that for every single one of us in this place this evening, if we want to be a follower of Jesus, we have to be rooted in the service because faith without deeds is dead. It's meaningless. It's just all this and none of this. So I'm going to encourage us as we think about where we are in our own spiritual journeys, and you don't have to be out on the marching line with me. You can be down feeding the homeless with John and Lewis, and that's just as much an effect. We can't do this all at the same time. We're better together, and we're better when we know where, where our lane is. My lane is to be the, the, the vocal, shout it, shout it, shout it, because I believe that that's what Jesus called me to be. But for other people, it's going to be about singing. For other people, it's going to be about feeding the homeless. And for other people, it's going to be about uh, opening a, a shelter for, for, for transgender youth who are being kicked out of their homes. And for other people, it's going to be other things. But find your lane. Find your act of service and root yourself in it so that you can transform the world as we are all being transformed together. And the people of God, faith without works is dead. So are we ready to come to life? Are we ready to make a difference in the world? Are we ready to be the people of God? God bless you. Cathedral of Hope United Church of Christ.